sport has taken me to a lot of like really cool and interesting places all around the world. Um, even like when, yeah, before when I was in university and I was a triathlete and, and traveling to, to different places for competition or, I mean, the only time I've been to Africa was for uh, university world championships, cross country running. And we went to Uganda so it's like, it takes like 30, it took, a, it was 34 hours of like travel to get to Uganda. We had two nights there, raced and then came back. So it was almost like, and then another 34 hours of travel. So it was almost like more travel time than it was um, being in Uganda. But it's like just these wild experiences that when, you know, when you get to live the moments, you just got to like soak it up while it's happening. So, I mean, a lot of that is due to sport. Um, a lot of it is also just due to like my personality of wanting to say yes to opportunities and then and seeing where it goes so with that particular trip how did you prepare for that <laughs> well yeah also it's like going uh uganda was also a quite high elevation i think we were racing at like 1700 meters or something like that so then yeah you go from your right like as a student in university you don't have all the resources to either prepare for altitude or even like the heat training stuff or whatever you just kind of go and hope for the best, you know, pace it a little, a little, <laughs> um, uh, conservatively and then yeah, hope for the best. But I mean, part of the whole thing was like, um, I mean, I was really just excited to go to a new place, have this opportunity. Um, and I mean, a lot of times you don't know what you're going to be met with. Um, but there was also, it was really cool, um, back in or in my like home church, there was this family that had moved to Uganda honestly in the city where I was going. So that's what's also something that's really cool about um, like traveling in the world is like the, you almost know it, the world is small that you might know people in all these like very random um, sort of places. So I mean, that was really cool. Too. Do you remember how you felt at the end of traveling for 32 hours to get there to run in this meet? <laughs> oh, well, I was young back then. <laughs> <laughs> what was I 20, 24 I don't know um but uh actually one of my um superpowers as a human is being able to sleep anywhere at any time so for a traveling athlete when you have to sleep on planes or in transit or you know different beds different temperatures different pillows or no pillows or whatever um I do really well so for me um yeah, and I think also I thrive on like the spirit of new or the spirit of adventure. So when you get there, um, yeah, I, I very can very easily switch to to whatever time zones, have a great sleep for the eight hours that I need, and then uh, and then just be excited about what you can get up to during the day. So for me, <laughs> that that was pretty good. I think I, right when I got there, I was just excited to meet the other people, go for a run, see what the course was like. Um, try to uh, figure out a way if we could see giraffes or any other kind of African wildlife while we were there. Um, yeah, maybe when I got back to Canada after the like long travel there and then on the back, the back end of it, when you also don't have to um, have the pressure of performing for any event, then maybe there was a little bit of a, of like a, a crash there. Maybe I was grumpy for about a day and then <laughs> carry on. <laughs> what was your pre-race meal? Oh, well, in, in Uganda, <laughs> I remember actually the night before the race, the mayor of the city wants to invite us all to this like dinner party before, but um, we have to race like pretty early in the morning and we're all, you know, kind of jet lagged and tired, but we go to this, <laughs> this like campground almost place for this like dinner, but then they're having all these performances and it's getting late and it's dark. It's like 9 PM. We still haven't eaten yet. And then we finally get to go to this buffet, but there's no lights. And they're just like dishing out of these like big pots, like almost like a big stone tall pot. You have no idea what's in there. We <laughs> So we take out a phone, turn on the flashlight to look. And the first pot that we look at, it's just all these fish heads looking up at us. And so, but I'm pretty sure there was not much meat or anything there, but there was like five different t types of, of uh, plantains you could eat. It could be a mashed plantain or a fried pan plantain or a um, yeah, baked plantain. So that was the main, the main uh, substance of our diet there, plantains. 
So, you know, I've heard you talk on other podcasts about growing up on a farm kind of in passing, but I'm really curious, like when you were a young person, what was a day in the life like on the farm and what kind of farm was it? What was going down there? Yeah, so we have a like a big scale like grain farm, so mostly like wheat and canola. Um, but then, um, yeah, we've always had bison, uh, so a bison ranch. And I remember when my family first kind of got into it, um, and then it's just like very cool because they're just like wild animals. We had a lot of space. Um, we would drive the trucks out just to show like with our binoculars to see the cause the animals because they're wild or try to catch. Um, you know, when they have a fresh little bison baby or whatever. Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, farming is my dad's work, but it's also his his passion, his, his uh, pastimes, whatever extra time he has to do something fun, it's going to be more farming. Um, so yeah, for sure, my life was just steeped in, in yeah, outdoor chores, um, lots of like tractor driving, even if it was like the little uh, lawn tractor that we had from <laughs> being a kid, you grow up just doing all this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, also when I was younger, we had horses and things and that was my thing for a while. Um, but yeah, just like uh, once we started going to school, it would basically be like go to school, come back and then do some farm chores. Um, and then uh yeah, um, but I had a younger brother that, uh, so I have an older sister, younger brother, and my dad was really keen on my younger brother being being the farmer, but I was the kid with all the energy, and I just kept being like, pick me, like, take, <laughs> let me come out. Um, but he, yeah, he was just really keen on my brother being the farmer, so then I just had all this, like, outdoor e energy that then my, um, yeah, mom put me in all these sports, and then, and basically I tried to do every sport that I could that was available in town, and Sometimes I would have like, uh, you know, back to back practices, um, throughout the week. Like I would have, you know, track and field right after school and then I would go right into soccer practice, but then after I might have a ballet class. So it was just like a full packed evening. Uh, but I loved it. Did you love all of the sports equally? Um, well, maybe, maybe I think whatever, when I'm in something, then I just, that's all I think about. And I want to be the best at it and get, give it all that I've got. Uh, but for sure, I really liked the, the, the creative sides of, of sports that I did. So when I was, I was in gymnastics for a little bit or dance. So things that are, that have a really nice blend of that, like physicality of a sport, but with, um, yeah, a little bit more creativity in it. Do you remember the first time you won a race? Hmm. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, might, it must have been in, like, won some, you know, blue ribbons in, uh, you know, like, recess track meets. Like, when you're in an elementary school, it's not a proper track meet, but, um, yeah, we run around it. We had a dirt track um, at our elementary school. Must have been something like that, but it's not like so memorable that I have it have the memory stuck in my mind. What's the first race that you won that you remember? Is there one that sticks out? Well, one that was really important to me was uh, in university. So that's still like, um, yeah, university. I, uh, when I, I had signed a, a running for a running scholarship at university and, uh, but the first year I got lapped like on track, the three K indoor, um, and I got lapped and, but then two years later I won that championship race. And then I was, I kept the title for two years winning the, the 3000 meter indoor um, but for me, I think that's like a super memorable win because, um, yeah, I really was like lapped last, um, and then through just like a lot of training, a great coach and, um, uh, sticking with it, uh, then to, you know, take the title later, it was really meaningful. 
Um, I think also there was, um, I mean, there's a few things when I was younger, um, like as a gymnast, uh, you know, this is, you know, low level, uh, sort of gymnastics as a kid, but, um, yeah, winning the overall of all the apparatus things and then getting to like move on to provincials, but then going to provincials because I came from a small town. So I get to be the best of the best in my small world. Then I go to provincials and then I was seeing tricks and things I'd never seen before. I never even knew was possible uh, because that the visibility of it wasn't available in my, in my small town, you know? Um, and then just thinking like, oh man, if I, if I had known this was possible, like I would be trying all these crazy tricks way earlier or whatever, but that's the kind of thing about being like a big fish in a little pond and then, and then going up to leveling up to the next level and realizing that actually I'm just like a small fish and there's such a bigger pond out there. When you did that race and you got lapped in university, do you remember how that felt? Oh yeah. I mean, it's a mix of like embarrassment, um, and, you know, cause I think going into that race, like I had got this scholarship cause I, I had won a race, a cross country race. Um, and so then, you know, the university was chatting with me and, you know, I signed on, um, but then yeah, going to this Canada West championship and then being lapped and just thinking like, whoa, like I, again, you know, I thought I was good. And, uh, but the, the other girls that are there are just that much better. So yeah, a bit, a bit of embarrassment or also thinking that like, I mean, I want to win so bad, but also like the university had taken what they thought was a winner and then, you know, missing the mark totally. Um, so, but I mean, you, you take a little bit of those feelings during the race and just be like, whoa, okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of room to improve and then just like sticking to it or like being so determined that, um, yeah, I wanted to win that race. And I know you've told the Perry Roubaix story a million times at this point. What I'm curious about is how many times had you been in a similar scenario at the end of a race and it actually didn't work out? Had you ever been in an analogous situation? Because when I was watching the race with my kids who were screaming, my daughter was going crazy and I was really excited. And I, I turned to them and I said, because you kept turning to the group and yelling at them to pull through. And I was like, this isn't going to work because she's, you know, she's having to spend energy yelling at the group. They're going to get caught. And then of course you did it, which was incredible. Um, but how many times had you been in that situation and it simply didn't work out? Oh, I mean, there are way more accounts like that than, than me coming through with a win. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, like, I know I'm a pretty good sprinter, but when you come with a group, to to a sprint to the line it's all about timing and you know so many more things can go wrong than than you know can go right and it's so hard to be you know that the one person that wins you know out of all the 200 people to start there's only just going to be one winner you know and um yeah I've had so many moments where you know then it becomes like a sleepless night after just like going through all the different ways that I could have you know what could I have done different to to make that that win happen and you know you can do the right things all day long and then lose it in just like the last hundred meters and uh I mean I even had it at nationals the the year before I mean I had come into nationals I had a terrible week of like sickness and just being in bed all week but nationals were in in my home area in Alberta and so you know I show up for the road race and still like one of my life philosophies is do well with what I have right now and even if it wasn't full health they're still like got strength on the legs like let's see what we can do and um yeah coming into the sprint and just like maybe not backing myself so well and being out of the wheels a little bit but then you know starting my sprint and just like passing so many people and then it became so close to the line that I basically if I just like held on to a different wheel or whatever I would have you know that would have been that would have been the win um and but then you know coming second there's no glory with that when you're first you get the jersey you get to wear it all year round you're recognized that whole year as national champion but missing out on that you know there's been um yeah other times uh like Tour of Scotland, they had it. One one year we did this race, and uh, I had won the first stage. And then, um, you know, had had 
we had the the second stage to go and um, it was pretty hard with this like kind of climb but I made it with the front group and all I had to do really was like I mean I didn't even have to win just be first or second even and and then I would have had the whole thing but in that sprint just like who I thought you know following the wheel that I thought would go and they didn't go got trapped a little bit behind came in fourth but the the um yeah girl who was second on GC um won the race so she got the bonus seconds and then took the whole thing and it's just like oh you know like you can say all you want that like you were the strongest rider there but you know in the end you have to put it all together with the timing um and the strength and whatever so yeah there's been so many more moments just like sleepless nights for that so that's why like when i crossing the line with perry roubaix and knowing that it was mine like you know i would say the whole time i believed i could do it but it's still you never know when until you actually cross that line, you know, or did I go too early? Did I do too much work? And that was like the gamble that I was going with is that, that I just wanted us to stay away so bad to have the, the shot at, um, you know, sprinting from a small group rather than the, the bigger group. Um, but then for it all to come together for me in that moment to actually be the first person to cross the line, then yeah, it, it when you recognize how many times you've just missed out um, there's way more of those for me than there has been the, yeah, coming through with the win. Yeah. And I don't have to tell you, but I will, that that was one of the most exciting conclusions to a bike race I've ever watched in my entire life. And it was just a thrill uh, just to get to see that happen. It was incredible. When you think about back on those other losses that you had though, that kind of set the stage for, or maybe they didn't set the stage because sometimes there isn't actually a lot of logic behind losses. Mm -hmm. It's just like, whatever, there's a split second decision, something happens. Maybe you could have had control over having a different outcome. Maybe you couldn't have, as you mentioned, you've had sleepless nights sometimes in situations like that. How do you process a loss? And do you have any kind of framework that you use to try to learn from those things and carry them forward? Or what do you do? Yeah, I think when when you have a loss, you I always have to take the time to actually like soak in the shitty feeling. <laughs> and because it when it means so much to you, um it, it and you know, you don't get so many opportunities to really be like at that the moment with the crux where you, you know, you could take a win. So yeah, it is it is a loss. So to just really feel that, recognize that also like you know, that's a part of your, you know, sport journey and stuff. Um, but then really like looking back and being able to congratulate yourself on things that you did well, because I mean, a lot of times, sometimes I come away from races where I almost made it, but I just have this feeling that like I'm a boss because there was moments where I just like did the right thing and it was great. So you really got to take those. So you keep like pumping yourself up for next races. Cause I mean, we will lose more than we win in, in cycling. So you really got to take up these pump up moments when you can get it. Otherwise it's, it's really hard to keep living in the cloud of, of, uh, you know, failure every time. So, but then I really take, you know, I, I will try to think of seven different scenarios of how I could have made the difference um, what I could have done to win. Sometimes it's like, okay, do we look at the training that was beforehand? Was there something, you know, could we have done something better with the equipment that would have, it would have helped? Um, it, was it something in my spirit? Like, you know, the, the mental focus of it, could I have fought more? Could I have, and with cycling, you know, it's not just, could I have fought more the whole race, but is, was there moments that I could have taking it easier here and then went harder there. That's kind of like, you know, choosing when you use your energy, um, which makes a big difference. And um, so, yeah, then I just try to really process through a few scenarios so that I can take that. Now I put that knowledge in the bank. So if I'm in a scenario like this, again, I have a few more options, um, you know, already ready that I don't have to think through that I can just utilize to, to try to make the best of the, the next opportunity. But yeah, usually it takes about a day before all the emotions kind of like wear out. And then, yeah, I mean, part of professionalism of our sport is that you got to leave that. You have to leave that where it is. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it now. And then you refocus for, 
for the next race. And we always have a, a next race and the next opportunity. So yeah, champions, you know, don't stay champions for long. You still right next race or next year, you have that same opportunity. So, um, yeah, just keep looking ahead. Got to stay positive. When you're processing through a loss is, do you do that by talking to other people? Is there a particular person you talk to or do you write in a journal? How do you like to do it? Yeah, a lot of it is just like really just like thinking over and over in my head. Um, I do always write a bit of a race report and some comments in my you know training peaks because that's something that from race to race you can look back. Um, you know, what were the things that I learned in the, the race in the previous season? When I was a younger athlete, I really did actually write out in a little journal um, or have basically a Word document um, from – especially with the classics um because we come back to those classics every year so little notes that i could learn about you know the course notes or things that how the race played out and um to use that then as as yeah good um i guess reminders for the next year to look back on um because i think when that's the you know what ben benefit experience is um you can look back on all, all these reference points um, and then, yeah, try, you know, my, I always really trust talking to my coach too, you know, and they give a, a better perspective on, um, you know, some of the physiology stuff versus what my feeling, my feelings will be, you know, based on, you know, RP or, you know, how it feels, um, what I was thinking, where I was mentally, um, or, you know, the moments in the race. Um, and then, you know, pairing that with the coach that can see, you know, from a, physiology point of view so then you can pair those together and maybe create a, a better a better story and also now like that most of our all our world tour races are are video and broadcasted then always to go back and look because um, you can have a memory of what you think was happening but when you look back you know there, there can be a disconnect of what you were thinking was happening in the moment and what what was actually happening so being able to look back and get a better like a broader perspective of the whole race um, yeah, that's kind of the process that I use. When you look down the road at accomplishments that you would like to achieve, what have you got in that? Just in the sporting domain, let's start there. What have you got in the bucket list? Are we going to see a gravel world championship in 2027? Like what's coming down the pipe? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's been really exciting. Like since, like 2021, I had a great year where I could check off like a ton of things um, that just would be really meaningful um, as a sports person in my career. And then this year too, I mean, I've always wanted to win a, you know, one day classic. I think those are the hardest races that are on the calendar. Um, and to get like the big one, Perry um, there's nothing better than that. Um, so then, yeah, now, you know, thinking of like what's next, but the thing is like, um, once you've won one, <laughs> it's not just like, that's good enough. You just like, you know, you want to, you know, what's on my bucket list for next year to win Perry Roubaix again. Could I do it, you know, two in a row? Like, you know, how do you become a legend in the sport? Um, is, uh, something that is also like, just put stars in my eyes, you know, but I, um, I mean, I always want to be national champion. I just, I really love, um, representing Canada that way. Um, and wearing the, the Maple Leaf jersey all year. I just, I think it's so special. So um, that that's a big goal for this year, but really every year of my career, I just, that's what I, that's the race that I want to win. Um, and as a Canadian, you know, our, our sport culture is not so steeped in cycling. Um, so when I tell people I'm a professional cyclist, a lot of times they ask either like, oh, like, so you go to the Olympics or, uh, you race the tour de France and now we have those two, I mean, we have those two opportunities, um, to make something happen. And so I would, I really would love to win a stage at the tour. Um, and, uh, I want to, yeah, be Olympic champion. And, you know, that, that's a, that's a, you know, a goal that you can only accomplish or have the opportunity to accomplish every four years. So it's a, a pretty rare thing to, you know, be at top form for something like that. But um, also 2026 world championships are going to be in Canada, in Montreal, which would be, um, you know, to be world champion, but in your home nation, that is also something that would be 
um, super special, but yeah. Um, but I'll take uh, being world champion uh, at, in any country in any year. So <laughs> <laughs> we're not just going to save it for then, but, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I still always, I really want to win uh, uh, Flanders. That's a, I mean, Paris Roubaix is, is one of these super well-known races and, and the type of rider that wins is, you know, resilient and tough and, you know, has to beat all the odds to get there. Um, and Flanders is also just a race that has such a long history and it's such a hard race. Um, and it's such an important race for our sport of cycling. Um, I would, I really would love to, to win that one. With the Olympics, with Flanders, with some of the other goals that you've shared, do you feel like you need to evolve anything about yourself as a rider or do you need to improve in any areas? Yeah. Um, I think, well, for Flanders, it's, it's becoming a little bit more of a, a climber type of rider that, that makes it rather than, you know, a traditional classic or, you know, in, it's been a, quite a few years since it's come down to kind of a bunch sprint, uh, really since 2017 when, uh, Corinne Rivera won, um, her teammates pulled it all the way back to have this bunch sprint. Um, and we, we don't see that so, so much now. So I think that would, yeah, trying to evolve a little bit more into a climber type, um, or, or specifically target that race in that way. Um, and then, yeah, for any kind of Olympic course, it, it's really interesting because the, the course will be different for every, every time. So really trying to figure out, yeah, what, what would you need, um, to do well there. I um, mean, and, and also, can I, uh, help my build a team that will, um, support that too? Cause, um, in our professional cycling, um, we're teams that understand how team work works and that some races we have, you know, this person as a leader and other races, it's going to change. And so a lot of times you always get an opportunity, but you, you know, uh, you can dig deep, uh, for a teammate in one race. Cause you know, maybe your opportunity is coming later, but for things like world championships and the Olympics, when you come with a national team where you haven't ridden with each other all year, um, and you know, it's, it's a kind of unique one-off race. Um, how do you really rally the troops on, uh, under, uh, a common goal? So I think, um, yeah, I've worked a little bit with the national team or with the, the other Canadian girls for world championships that were in Australia and Wollongong last year to try to kind of raise support together and try to do some pre-planning before that we could all, you know, really um, be on board for, for the same goal and the same plan that we just want a Canadian winner. So I think there for the Olympics and for world championships, I think that's something that's really important is how do you rally the troops together for a common goal? Um, and you know, not only that, but also skill development together. Um, we don't get a ride together every year, um, like you do on your professional team. So if you can, you know, do things that, that really build up the teamwork in our sport, that's going to make a big difference for if you're going to, if you're going to be able to take the win. Um, yeah. And then, and then also, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, mostly it would just be like looking at the, at the course and, you know, um, for example, this year in Glasgow, it's likely like a course that would generally suit me. Um, and then, you know, it's just, can, um, can I have that sprint power, um, at the end to, uh, come off with a good result yeah. to move, to move in a different direction. you you have a massive social media presence. Your, uh, TikTok videos are pretty famous. When you were a kid, were you into storytelling and did you enjoy getting attention? Oh, totally. I, I've always been the entertainer. So, um, yeah, as a kid, even going to other people's birthday parties, I was always the one trying to make everyone have a good time or or get people to laugh. Um, you know, the class clown in school just love um yeah, absolutely love getting getting people to laugh or being a little bit part of the drama. Um and also, yeah, when I was a kid, I loved the storytelling and I loved making videos too. I remember asking for a, 
a little camcorder for Christmas one year and, and then trying to rope in my brother and sister to be in these little videos I would want to make or like I remember even like for school projects I remember one time I made um might have been in like eighth grade making a a video with the the Barbies that we had or something just like little so stupid like I, it might have been like even like a science video I don't know what it was but just like um yeah I really love sort of creative storytelling and things that are are funny um yeah and then actually even in university um they had this contest um their university with a couple of the universities were were creating their own um you know platform for inter-university uh, kind of it's like a Facebook or whatever but um and uh, they had this contest um that you could win like you know, $2,500 or something. Um, if you like different social media posting, or if you posted videos, you get more points or things like this. So I was making all these silly videos with like hula skirt and a hot sauce. And, uh, um, yeah, even like doing things out on the street with like interacting with, you know, yeah, people on the street making videos and stuff. So yeah, I really do just like, um, love making videos and storytelling and, um, having a good laugh about it. When you think back on university in that period of time when you were making that set of videos, were there any other things like on TV, on social media that inspired you? Um, I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to tell where your inspiration comes from, you know, because we, I mean, we do have or are bombarded with different like, you know, videos and other things. But I think also just like, I do just have this creative spirit about me or something might just like hit me in a different way that makes it funny. And then I build out the story in my mind um, and then just want to try to portray it in a video. And, um, and yeah, sometimes I don't know like where those um, ideas come from. What was fun, like with TikTok basically as a platform, a lot of times you like take someone's um someone makes a video and you copycat it, but you know, maybe put your own thing on it. And what, for yeah. a while, when I first started, I just loved doing that, but then making it like with my brain, with my um, lens of a cyclist, then I would apply that to, you know, someone else's videos, but turn it into the cycling video that then I think would just be funny. And that was like my take on the, on the concept, I guess. Um, yeah. So, I mean, really inspiration can come from anywhere, like a funny conversation with someone or like, uh, you know, a play on words um, that you can just like take and then build it out to <laughs> be crossing the line, you know? So, yeah. When you think about the videos that you're making now, is there at this point, is there a formula or are there specific elements that you're like, yeah, I have to have X, Y, and Z for this thing to do what I wanted to do or to make people feel the way I want them to feel. You know, it, also when I started posting like my videos on, on Instagram and on social media, it's really because I was making the videos for me and I thought they were so funny. And then I just thought, Oh, if they're so funny to me, I wonder if other people would laugh too. And so the posting them. And then I loved interacting with fans and people just being like, you know, commenting that this was the funniest thing that they saw all day or like why they thought it was funny or so, I mean, I just love sharing my joy or then and sharing that laughter with, with people, friends and family and, and fans as well. Um, so then now it's interesting because I mean, you, I could get really into the metrics of like, Oh, what hits well and what, what doesn't. But honestly, sometimes I have no idea. I, I remember, I don't, even um, my first like viral, like real most popular um, video with my crash dance um, in tour Scandinavia last year, um, <laughs> I remember posting and thinking, oh, it's, it's, it. it's probably it's probably an average video. But then it has like, you know, more than a million views or whatever. So sometimes it's like, yeah, what really hits well? I don't know. But, you know, the. I enjoy making the the making of the video and then posting it and, and seeing people's reactions. And some that I think are just like the best videos, sometimes like the public, it just doesn't hit well. And that's fine. Cause like, I just like really enjoy um, producing and making the videos, but it was funny after my Perry Roubaix win, I knew that people, the fans would want um, a video with the rock, but they would want a video with some dancing. 
<laughs> and then I also wanted it to be funny in some way that it would be, you know, like something a little bit clever and a little bit funny. And so then that was like kind of the first time I thought, oh, I feel like a little bit of pressure like this, you know, with all these new followers and people, I really got to like make this one a good one. Um, and, uh, you know, then I, I think I did. I think uh, the I want to rock video was was just like perfect a little bit of dance had the rock and then it also had this funny play on words that i um, really appreciated part of what i found to be interesting about that video i don't know if this was a conscious connection for you but for me the perry roubaix podium ceremony this year because it had, like had the shooting flames and yeah. it had like a real glam rock kind of feel to it. It totally. reminded me of like, I was like, this is like a Def Leppard concert, you know? Yeah, so like, this is, totally. this is pour some sugar on me at a bike race. I'd never seen anything <laughs> like it before. So that was, uh, I thought that was really fun. I mean, you mentioned in the context of going for an Olympic title or going for a world title that you have to work to develop some team spirit and do some skill development together with the riders from, from Canada that you're going to be racing with. And on the storytelling side, I'm curious, like, do you have a protege Are people coming to you? Or are they like, Hey, can you, know, can you kind of take me under your wing and just show me the ropes of, uh, you know, how to really get things cooking as a TikTok star? <laughs> uh, I have not had that, <laughs> which I think is also fun, which, well, it makes me like, I guess, very unique in the space that, that I'm doing. Um, you know, cycling silly videos with, but I do have people wanting to come and make videos with me or be in my videos and, or, you know, some people, I had a teammate, you know, at our first camp, just, um, you know, kind of quietly asked me like, what, what would it take to be in one of your videos? And I was like, oh, like, you know, if you got dance moves, we can put that in. Also, if you don't got dance moves, I've got lots of other ideas of how to make a video that you can <laughs> be in my video. Um, when I was in Panama, actually, uh, I raced uh, Pan Am Champs um, this year, and uh, there's these two or three girls from Costa Rica that came up and and said uh, to me, like after the race, that you know, oh, they're you know big fans, and we took a photo together, and they're like, oh, we we filmed a TikTok today, and I was like, show me. So they show me, and I'm watching it. I just like tell them to put it on a loop so that I can learn it, and then I was like, let's film it right now. And so then we filmed it, and then like for that, what I love is like. One, I'm giving them a story to tell their friends. And like, I love stories. And if I can give someone a great story that, you know, they're just have a story to tell other people, I think it's awesome. But also that, you know, they were filming a TikTok and wanted to show me, but then I was like, let's make it even better. Like, I'm going to be in it. And we did this and we filmed this um, TikTok just right then. And um, so I have, that, I have that more often that, you know, people like maybe come and ask to be in a TikTok. I have one um, teammate right now, a uh, young Canadian, Magdalene, who uh, she also, like, she she's much a quieter, reserved person than me, but she likes to make videos. Um, and I think it's like, she'll have a lot of ideas, but I'm the person that will actually do something about it. So what I love is like, when you can have another creative person that you, you can talk through some ideas or you can like build off of each other. Um, so she, she's been a, 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 a main character in, in a lot of my, um, yeah, films this year from, from, uh, team camp. Also my, my teammate, Zoe Vaxted, who's just has a, a very loud personality too, and, um, a lot of energy. And so when I pitch an idea, they're like willing to be in something that's silly. I think sometimes my older teammates are take themselves too, too seriously, maybe um, to, to take the time to do something silly or something that's like a bit awkward to start with or something like that. But um, yeah, I, I haven't had anyone really approach me about, about being a protege or taking over. Um, I have seen some other, um, you know, cyclists, you know, take up doing some, some fun videos and stuff. And I think, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Well, within the world of pro cycling, is there anyone else who's a TikToker that you're like, yeah, you've got a pretty strong game? Um, yes. <laughs> Going to the a, phone. Um, Going to the yeah. phone. We're about <laughs> yeah. to stay tuned. <laughs> I'm just going to make sure I'm saying the right name. Um, this guy 
<laughs> um, Rick, Rick Zabel. <laughs> Rick Zabel. Julian, Rick Zabel. Yeah. He has some pretty funny videos that he's come out with. Um, and for a while there, he was filming like a little video every day, but sometimes he pulls out like a good, a good joke here and there that I appreciate. Um, um, but there's not, then there's more like, there's a lot of like cycling influencers that then their job is just to make content. And then they make some really good, funny videos that I love, but they're not trying to blend um, professional racing with content creation. They're just all in on the content creation. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love the stuff that, that they have time to, to create. Um, and then I, I also like, uh, like, uh, Nathan Haas, he's, uh, retired now. Well, he's a gravel racer, maybe we could say, um, but he's really fun too. He he was in a dance video of mine, um, I think in twenty in twenty twenty or twenty twenty one, and we made this um, sort of Girona tourism dance video. Um, and he's really he's a creative guy and has a great spirit. So hopefully we'll do another collab video another time. But um, yeah, I guess like not not quite someone just like me. Are there any other celebrities outside of the world of? pro cycling or in other domains of pro sport that you're looking to collaborate with? Oh man. You know, that's the thing. I actually like, I love collaborating with brands and sponsors or other people because um, it just gives me like another leverage point to think creatively or another thing to like, you, you know, I have all my brands and sponsors that, you know, I get ideas from, but then when you can work with someone else, it's just like another outlet of like, Oh, what's a new like creative sort of space and there's tons of um dance choreographers and and just like true yeah tiktok um dance content creators that i would love to work with so my favorite there's this uh cost and mayor is what their hashtag is but i i've i've learned a ton of their dances and stuff too because i just think that they're so fun and so i would love it if i could um yeah meet up with some like of these choreographers and stuff and be in be in some storytelling dance videos. The longer you do this, are you finding that you're able to get your dance moves styled in faster? Yeah, well, yeah, I think that's the thing, like um, even with the girls from Costa Rica when they were showing me the video and I could just watch it, you know, three times and then I was like, all right, I got it. Um, I think that is like, um, I can learn things pretty quickly and of course the more that you do it then the the better you get but it's also like yeah once you kind of learn a dance move sometimes it shows up over and over or something's just a little bit different or maybe you stylize it a little different so like once you kind of got the basics of the things then yeah it's like easier to to learn and then um yeah the thing is like when choreography or when dance stuff gets hard is when it's like really fast so um that's like where the advanced go i'm i'm going to be like a beginner intermediate until i can like you know maybe spend as much training time on the dance moves as i do on the bike and are you editing everything yourself like what's your process like yeah totally just me me and my phone really and the free app um or maybe i pay for the app but <laughs> um, yeah it's a like uh, what was really fun about coming on onto this team, uh, EF Tibco SVB, is like they have a great media and marketing team. And what I love is like I think I've got a lot of good content ideas, but sometimes the the actual filming of it is is low quality or medium quality. But the storytelling is there, so then then that's like the meat of the of the video, and it still can hit well even if the quality is not so great. But what I love is working with maybe some of these brands that just have like yeah the editing team, the, the cameras, the fog machine, the lights, and then we can create something that um, is really creative and also just like very smooth and just looks really good. Um, yeah, I think that's probably like, um, if I could dedicate more time or resources to some of the like quality stuff of my videos, I think that would really amplify it or like have, you know, other people help me um, yeah, with the production stuff and oh man, I have so many more ideas of things that we, what we could do with that. Um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's just me on my own. Um, you know, I'll be sitting in my bed on my phone, just laughing at myself forever while I'm, I'm listening to the same 15 seconds of song <laughs> over and over while I'm editing. 
<laughs> what are some of these ideas? Now I feel like I've got to hear them. What are some of the big ideas that you have that you want to execute in this space? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I have some, you know, like almost like like a, a video storytelling idea, but that but then it becomes really like almost cartoonish or where things get like really silly. Um, but then you would need like some of the extra resources or like drone shots or like some other like video angled tricks. Um, or like I say, like if, you know, maybe it's like a, a dance video, but like in really interesting other spaces or with like, yeah, other influencers or like, you know, big name people that can make it, you know, cameos of people that can be, um, fun. But also I have some ideas for like, like, uh, longer storytelling so not just these like 30 second tiktok videos but actually either like a documentary storytelling or um you know i have i have uh well i can't tell spill all my ideas here, yeah but... <laughs> i get it yeah totally <laughs> but um yeah so or but the production quality of like some like a bigger project to take on you know like a you know adventure ride or um like i i say you know you can tell the same story over and over, but in a different way, you know, with these different lenses. And I have a couple ideas, even about Perry Bay, that um, how we can tell the story, but it's not about me. But it's this, it's that same story, but it's through a different lens. Um, so I have a few, yeah, ideas like that. It's about a mouse that rides a motorcycle. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to out your idea, but I have to feel like, yeah. Well, I think in the last couple of days, it's come out that Ben Stiller is a big Garen Thomas fan and has been commenting on his Twitter posts, which Garen Thomas was ignoring and then I think has finally acknowledged. So, I mean, who knows? I feel like if Ben Stiller is a Garen Thomas fan, he has to be watching your TikToks. So the door could be open to Hollywood pretty soon. Right. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll... um. I'll just keep an eye out on the, on the comments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at this point you've got an awful lot going on between what you're doing as a storyteller, what you're doing as a pro athlete. Have you even thought about, Hey, what am I going to be doing in 10 years? Do you have goals or ambitions for where you want to go down the road? Yeah. You know, um, I think like w with this lifestyle, like as a pro cyclist, it's, it's, uh, I guess like a volatile market, basically, you know, um, you could be at your top of the game one year and then crash out and never race again. Um, maybe not so extreme, but sometimes it's that extreme. And so I think I really just have to take, I take my career kind of like holding it in my hands where my hands are open and things can fall through the fingers. Like you, you can't hold onto it so tightly um, because, you know, how do you, how do you really plan and make your own future? It, it's, um, you have to be really open to and adaptable. So um, I really just, I love what I do. I, I love racing my bike. I love training. Um, I love the travel. Um, I love the new experiences. I love creating the videos and, and, you know, making people laugh. Um, and so I always said like, I would do it as long as uh, like, I still love it as long as I still love the chaos. Cause I think when you get older, Sometimes that chaos and the risk factor is kind of what slows you down or, or maybe takes you out. But if I can still be a difference maker to my team, so whether that's me being the winner or me being the person who makes a difference for a teammate to win, then I want to stay um, in the sport. But I, I mean, I really do love this storytelling in the video. Um, I love using my personality to entertain. So, you, so, you know, I'm dabbling in a few things of like, whether it goes kind of like um, in the entertainment space of like TV presenting or, or maybe some more entertainment stuff that way, or maybe in the video space um, uh, or film production or something in that space. Uh, or maybe it's more in like the, you know, cycling tourism where you can take people to go see all these amazing and wonderful places. And also, you know, I think sport is so valuable for everyone um, when you find out what you thought was not possible is possible. And I think through sport, you get to challenge yourself and you go in a safe way beyond what you thought you could ever do. And then I think you take that self-efficacy or that confidence and you can take that into other, you know, spaces and areas of your life. Um, so yeah, 
it to help um yeah people push the boundaries of what they believe is is possible for themselves i would love but also i mean i i love the bike and where the bike is taking me to see new places and meet new people and discover new cultures and you know you get these new reference points and then you really have to what what you've thought was you know the true for so long you got to take all these other um worldviews and spaces and, and challenge kind of what you thought and you see and and i think you just grow and mature um and just become a, a better human that way um and then I, I mean i also love like a great dance party so if we can you know pair some some bike riding tours and with a great dance party um and some really good wine and new foods and places like that's really cool too so i mean i have a lot of interest in, in a lot of areas so i think um yeah, I'm just going to keep saying yes to opportunities as they come along and, um, yeah, exploring some of these other spaces.